I remember when I read the script, I said, if this is realized anything like it reads, it's going to be bananas. And turns out from the first 30 seconds, you're just like, whoa, you're just strapping in and getting ready for the blast off. And it's, it's what happens, you know, for a film that is so, I think, historically relevant and genuinely entertaining. It's, uh, I mean, it's like, you know, it's Hitchcock, it's Kubrick, it's all these weird kind of manipulations of your psyche and your heart and all that stuff. IMAX is incredible. And realizing that IMAX has never had something like this, where literally new versions and iterations of how IMAX is even experienced, obviously are, are taken to this next level by Chris Nolan and co. Um, but also just to see whether it's the Trinity test site or a uh, extreme close-up of, of Killian as Oppenheimer, you're just like, you feel like you're standing next to something that's really happening in history. It's a huge uh, film experience, but it feels very small and focused and kind of intimate when you're doing it, and I think that translates. Um, there's also the onus is on you to rise to the occasion, and, and Chris tends to uh, cast and collect folks around him that are um, as without ego as possible while still having some self-respect and thinking they can get the job done. And so it was a journey into it reminded me of back doing theater. It reminded me of, you know, what my first instincts and hopes and dreams were for being an actor. That day where uh, Conti and Murphy are having their little sidebar tete-a-tete, -tete, um, and I could tell uh, Chris knew it was a, obviously a critical scene. It's kind of the heart of the film. I'm there as kind of a uh, hapless and pissed off observer who misinterprets the whole thing. And it was like, wow, we're shooting this part of the movie now. And this is where his vision, this is kind of the spinning top at the end of Inception moment for this, except this is a historic occurrence. This is about our real lives on this real planet here and now. And I was like, yeah, this is kind of important. Uh, and then I just always try to just say, re remember this, take a mental picture of this. This is really cool. This is the kind of stuff you were hoping to do when you were a teenager. So you got one, you got one in. You know? <laughs> well, first I was just looking at pictures and I'm, I'm just trying to see if I can really find him in there. And I felt like I had a bit of communion with him. I mean, with something like Chaplin, there's so much reference that you're kind of on the hook to be able to match the reference. And with him, I felt kind of free to explore my own understanding of him. And I came to love the guy and have a lot of empathy for him. And I think he also represents any of us that have ever felt blown off by someone that has a higher status. And also um, that act of a deniable, plausible, non-traceable revenge. Just how sweet it is. Um, so it's just a human condition as he represents it. Well, I was just texting with Josh Hartnett a few days ago, and um, I, I don't think he knows how good he is in the film. Obviously, you know, Matt and Emily and Florence, and I, I got to watch Rami Malek just absolutely slay it on this one day and put my character in check. I spent many of my days with Alden Ehrenreich. He and I are now close friends. Scott Grimes was there, and it, it was, it just seemed like every day was another one of my peers knocking it out of the park. And there was this kind of almost like regional theater vibe amongst all of us. Like, you know, this is who we are and this is what we do. And this is a, a peak uh, experience.
We knew, because you came down to hang out with John right after Nolan had been over and met Matt and given Matt the script to read. So I knew that Matt was meeting him and, I mean, any chance any of us could get yeah, to like sure. work with him, we're all sort of champing at the bit. But what was kind of funny was that he <laughs> came to, we live in the same apartment building, and so he came to see me and he knew that he was going to Emily with, with the part but he didn't want it to seem like he was just kind of <laughs> one only stop shop <laughs> one stop shopping so he bumped into John in the in like either the elevator or the lobby and John talked to him for a half an hour just kind of director to director I, you know they're talking shop and and Chris later admitted that he knew he was coming to Emily with the part but he waited like it was like 5 days or something yeah. <laughs> and knew she was going to be in LA and then she came over at, to his house and read the script and he didn't you know. want sort of convenient casting rumors you know that it was like who else is in your building who else can right. we cast <laughs> that's already <everybody else. laughs> right start knocking else? on doors is robert here? downey yeah. in his building <laughs> he's got that level uh, that attention to detail that you know Stanley Kubrick had, you know, where it's like no detail is too small. His yeah. like depth of knowledge, his research, his understanding of all the dynamics at play between all these different characters and ways to just get these ideas and succinctly like and fit them into a movie. I mean, the, the, the book that this is adapted from is like a tome and it is dense with like, I mean, the fine print. I remember it was like I needed reading glasses to even read the book. It yeah. was just very thoroughly researched and he somehow was able to kind of get all of it into this film. Mm. But it, but what that means is that each frame is entirely packed full of information. I mean, you could watch this movie 10 times and get something different because it's just so rich and dense. Um, and he kind of, on set, I just feel his command of excellence is so vast and everyone just has to match him where he is. And I don't find Chris <laughs> exacting. I think people have used that word, and I don't find him that way. I find him really curious and interested in what you might bring or do, and you recognize he's cast you for a reason. He lets you know that, and then wants to see what wings you have, you know, and I, I love that I think he's exacting him. in some ways. I think yeah. he's exacting about some details, right? Oh, yeah, like, like he sweats the small stuff, and I want to work with a director who sweats the small stuff. I want him to see everything. But in terms of everything. performance, you're totally There's free. free. You're There's totally freedom. totally free. He really wants to see and what you're going to do. such authority on set. Like, I mean, he, he, he appears to be very calm. I'm sure there is a storm of information going on inside of him, but it's all clad in this sort of quite serene uh, exterior, you yeah. know, that he's really fascinating. And he's funny. Yeah. People don't know that about Chris. He's really fun. I love him. The vibe on set is really... Uh, we, we, nobody says it out loud, but everybody feels really lucky to be there. Yeah. And so you just get this spirit, you know, from every department, like everybody's killing it. Everyone's doing everything they can, you know, working till you are bone tired because you, you don't, you want to leave it all on the field, you know, because that's what he does. He's very demanding of himself. Yeah. Um, and so without having to say anything, you know, you just see that and you kind of take your cue from that and you work, you know, in a similar vein. He's a big guy, Chris. He's tall. He's like, he's, he's imposing as a figure. I don't know how he is able to be invisible. You don't, I didn't notice him standing by the camera yeah. staring at me. Like he's somehow able to disappear. It was yeah. cool. He's like, like those directors, you know, before we had Video Village. I mean, that's what Coppola said to me 30 years ago. He said that the, the, the Antonioni, the, the Italians taught him that the where you sit is to, right next to the camera, and at the and you see it with your naked eye as you understand human behavior. Because you, you feel it. Because you feel it, and you turn to the operator, who's the only one who's looking through the lens, and and you just check in and make sure that they saw what you saw, and they'll give you a little nod, mm. and and you know you've got it. And that's how movies were made until you know whenever the monitors came around. And you get that sense with him that his decision of when he has the take and when he's happy is not led by the visuals, it's led by the feeling he has. He's so English, he's the most English person I've ever met. Like he's, he's like my family. I don't want to tell him this, but he looks like my uncle. Like it's all quite funny <laughs> watching him. But there, there will be no sort of superlative praise. It will be like, yeah, happy, good, yeah, okay, moving on. And you're like, okay, that's it. I saw it with Robert and, and with John and with Robert's wife, Susan, and it was 
very emotional watching it and I felt like I was inside of it. I felt like the arms of the movie came out and wrapped around me and pulled me right into it. It was bone shattering watching it. I just loved it. Yeah, me too. Me too. It's, it's great. It's overwhelming. It was like the, the experience I had reading the script. That feeling just was magnified by the by the film. Um, you know the how overwhelming it was. You know because the film it was written in in the first person, which I'd never seen before. Mm. And so it it just it just pulled you in, and and you had this really subjective experience that was really overwhelming. And it feels um, like a runaway train that you're on. It's so exciting watching it. Incredible. It's a dream, really. Uh, I never imagined I'd be working with all these actors all in the one movie. I mean, I think it's one of the greatest ensembles, certain, certainly modern ensembles that Chris has put together. But that just shows you, you know, everybody wants to work with Chris. You know, and these, these actors will turn up um, because they, they love his movies, they love his writing, and, and he's an incredible director. So, yeah, it was a gift for me every day. And also, you know, when, when, you, when you wake up and you're you know, one day you're doing a scene with Matt Damon, one day you're doing a scene with, you know, Ken Branner or Emily Blunt or, you know, Gary Oldman. You know, you just, uh, it's kind of electrifying and you just gotta, you gotta turn up the volume on your own performance a little bit, I think, you know? Well, the way Chris works, you know, there's no video village or monitors or anything like that. And obviously it's film cameras, so there's, you don't see any playback. The first frame of the movie that I saw was the first, trailer uh, um, and then when I finally got to see the finished film it was it was completely completely overwhelming um, but I, but because there, was, there had been a gap between you know wrapping the movie and watching it I suppose I had some distance no I, and to answer your question I know I, I hate looking at myself I don't really know any actor that enjoys the experience but um, I found it I, I was completely blown away by it uh, you know it's it's a truly essential cinematic immersive experience uh, you know um, like Chris said it's like it's like 3d without the 3d glasses you know particularly in an IMAX and and I and I and I felt that I would like to watch it maybe once more with a with an audience for me it's the best way to experience a film is you know in a, in a, in a darkened space with strangers and you know you, you just there's no interruption you know, you're 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 not going to answer the door. You're not going to make a cup of tea. You're just you're you're invested, and you paid your money. You got your snacks, and you're there. And uh, uh, there's something hugely romantic about it to me. Uh, there al there always will be. And I think what's extra special about this film is it's talking about the world. You know, it's really digging at, at uh, what it means to be humans and our responsibility as humans on this planet, and how what we do with the power that we can harness and and in this case, you know, this, this extraordinary and destructive and appalling weapon. And, you know, it, it, it's amazing. And, you know, I think it was Truffaut said, you know, we go to films to escape from life, but also to learn about life. And I think this is one of those great films. It does that, it entertains, and it's incredibly entertaining, but it's also, you know, it makes you, makes you think. Well, I think he's kind of the ideal director. Right, because he's, he, he, he writes his movies, he directs the movies, he produces the movies. Uh, he's incredible visually. Um, and he is extraordinary with actors. And it's very few directors have all those uh, talents in, in, in one person. Um, have, I, have I seen him change over the course of working with him? I guess he's become more and more confident in the sorts of stories that he to, that he wants to tell, and I think he's more and more confident in making films, uh, you know, within the studio system that actually challenge the audience. And I lo I've always love that he's presupposed a level of intelligence with the audience. He always knows that the audience are smart enough to go with him, and he never patronizes an audience. Or never he's never prescriptive or didactic in his movies. They're always kind of a challenge to you and you, you need to go, you need to work, you know, but the, re the, the reward you get for the work is, is terrific. And uh, I, I've learned so, so much from him, you know, I, it's, it's kind of changed, you know, it's changed my life, uh, my creative and professional life working with Chris and uh, I hope I continue.
you know, there's a universality to it that people connect with. And people understand the themes that are in this movie. And, you know, there's big questions being, being, being asked of the audience. There's no answers being given, which I think is, is excellent filmmaking always. But, you know, it's also, it, it, it's, it, it's, got, it's, like it's, it's like a thriller. It's a, it's a love story. It's, to me, there's elements of horror in there as well, you know, for sure. Um, so that just resonates w with an audience. And I think the period setting, however familiar or, or not you may be with what happened in 45, I think you will just be wrapped up in it. The movie grabs you by the throat, like from the beginning, and, and like you, you just don't take a breath, I think, from, from start to finish, really. Right. Because we are now living in a nuclear age because of what happened then. I mean, he did change the world, you know, and that, and that, that event changed the world forever. We're, we're living with the fallout of that ever since, you know. I've been interested in the story of, of J. Robert Oppenheimer for some time. Um, I really got hooked by that moment where the people working on the Manhattan Project realized that when they detonated the very first atomic device, there was a small but quantifiable possibility, just a slight chance, that in doing so they would set fire to the atmosphere and destroy the entire world. Uh, and yet they they went ahead and uh, you know pushed that button, and I wanted to take the audience into that room and be there for those kind of momentous decisions because Oppenheimer, through becoming um, as he's termed the father of the atomic bomb, uh, he's one of the most important people in uh, human history. Oppenheimer's story is as as big and dramatic a story as as I know of. And so I wanted to put it on the biggest screens possible and get it out there to as many people as possible. His story um, affects all of us. His actions, for better or for worse, have defined the world we continue to live in. Uh, and so getting his story out there on the biggest screens possible to the widest audience, uh, that was really the ambition for the project. At the center of Oppenheimer is Killian Murphy's performance as, as Robert Oppenheimer. I worked with Killian for years, but I never had the chance to have him as the lead of one of my projects. So I was very excited to be able to call him up and say, you know, this is the one, this is where you get to, to carry the audience through, through a story. And, and it's very much a question of carrying the audience because I really wanted Oppenheimer's story to be told subjectively. I really wanted to bring the audience into his experience and, and experience events as he did. Um, there's an extraordinary cast around him. Um, the film is a combination of uh, a great central performance, but also this incredible ensemble cast of Robert Downey Jr., Matt Damon, Emily Blunt, Florence Pugh, uh, and many, many more, uh, really trying to bring to life uh, the real uh, historical people who contributed to, to this amazing story that Oppenheimer was the center of, but was very much uh, a sprawling you know, team effort in the Manhattan Project, and then the global ramifications of everything that, that happened at Los Alamos. Um, you know, we needed this amazing cast to get these momentous events across. Oppenheimer's story is, is very exciting. Uh, it's a little strange to use a word like entertainment, you know, when it comes to something as, as serious as nuclear weapons, which is what the film is dealing with. But I think cinema has always had the potential to draw people into an experience and give them this extraordinarily dramatic uh, tale, uh, following and, and seeing uh, through Oppenheimer's eyes all of the crazy paradoxical situations that he was involved with. Um, you know, we want the audience to have a very, very engaged, exciting experience watching the film uh, and hopefully on, on the biggest screen possible.